when I got into the, the oil and gas industry, I was told by, you know, people much older than me, you absolutely have to understand title in order to be a landman. And regardless of what your role is within a land service company, public or private, you have to understand title. You have to understand how to, how to meet landowners face to face, negotiate oil and gas leads. Um, and then that gets more into the, you know, you need to understand HPP title, due diligence, and basically how, how do you add value on the, on the land service side? Welcome to the Land Department Podcast. The state of land and energy as we see it. Brandon, what's up, man? What's up, Khalil? How are you? I'm great. It's been a while since you've brought on a guest with us. You know, I went out in hiding for a little while. Yeah. Golf season. Golf season, gotcha. <laughs> I just realized our shirts are looking awfully similar. Yeah. I got, little, I got little flowers. Looks like you might have like little uh, dots or something. Yeah, I think they are flowers, but they're just smaller. But our uh, our guest looks better than both of us. Absolutely. He always he always walks in a room and people start staring at him. Uh, <laughs> <that's pretty>. <laughs> <laughs> Josh, how are you, man? I'm doing well. How are you? Wonderful. It's a pleasure to have you on. Pleasure to meet you as well. Excited for this this conversation to get into your background and learn everything about the work you're doing as well. Um, Josh, how did you meet? Uh, how did you meet Brandon? Uh, I, well, firstly, thanks for having me on. Yeah. It's a, an honor. It's a privilege. I appreciate it. Um, I met Brandon in Tulsa, I believe at an industry event back, uh, had to be 10 plus years ago. I don't remember if it was a TAPL or Tulsa Adam, but, and we started playing golf together. Then we started going on a few hunting trips together and then we just, uh, we stayed in touch. Uh, obviously being in the industry makes it easier, but we just stayed in touch this entire time. Yeah. I think, um, I knew Larry Brunsman from my time working with Mike Brunsman at Dudley, uh, when he was here. And so I actually think he made the introduction if I remember correctly. And then we both liked golf and we both liked hunting and just, uh, shoot the rest is history. Yep. Traditional Larry Brunsman bringing people together yeah, for sure. And that, he wouldn't mind me saying that funky golf swing he's got. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, he's got a little hitch. <laughs> what he loves, but it's he. I think he's still single digits yeah. uh, as far as the handicap, so he can still yeah, be he can still play too. He can still play <laughs> for sure. Man, so uh, Josh, why don't you share a little bit about your background with us uh, for listeners who don't know you? Sure. So I, I grew up in Edmond, Oklahoma. I went to. Uh, uh, University of Central Oklahoma. I played football there for a couple of years. And then uh, I got into the industry actually while I was still an undergrad. So I worked for um, two uh, land service companies. One was Ronda Oil and Gas and another was uh, Stryker Land Services. So that was my junior and senior year. My sophomore year, I actually interned in Houston for Devin in their land department, <clears throat> primarily working in the Barnett Cheryl and the Eagleford. And then junior year, and senior year, uh, I would go to class uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, uh, finishing up my BBA. And then on Tuesdays and Thursdays, I would travel from courthouse to courthouse, running title, typically HGP title uh, for Grande and for Stryker. I spent a lot of time in Wheeler County, Texas, and I spent a lot of time in King County. So those were my two main counties. They were relatively close to Edmond, so that made it easier on me, not so much driving time. So um, then I, Ended up graduating with my BBA from UCO. And my first job after undergrad was with Chesapeake. I was a landman there working the Fayetteville Shale. And this was in 2007. And so this was kind of the, the rapid expansion of the unconventional shale gas plays with the Barnett starting it. Then it went over to the Fayetteville in Arkansas, then the Haynesville, Louisiana, and then uh, the Marcellus in West Virginia, Pennsylvania, and parts of Ohio. Um, so I spent from 2007 to 2010 there, primarily working um, the Anarcho Basin or Western Anarcho Basin in, in Oklahoma or Texas Panhandle and then the Fayetteville Shale in Arkansas. In 2010, um, ironically, since Brent brought him up, uh, Larry Brunsman was promoted to land manager of Apache's Tulsa region, which managed at the time about 500,000 net leasehold acres across Western Oklahoma and Texas Panhandle. And they had seven rigs running and they were expanding their land groups. So he reached out to me, interviewed me a couple of times. 
gave me the opportunity to relocate from Oklahoma City to Tulsa. And I spent from 2010 to 2015 working for Apache. Um, it was it was pretty fast tracked uh, right when I got to Tulsa in 2010. Uh, given that they had seven rigs, they ultimately went to nine rigs. And I had at least two rig lines for the first couple of years. Then that grew um, to about four and in, going into 2013. And at the time, Apache was doing a, a lot of, um, uh, a lot of, let's say, fun things. They, oil prices were high at that time. Um, the granite wash was a, a major play again at that time. So Apache was developing the Marmington D, primarily in Beckham County and Washtenaw County. Um, they had a couple Cottage Grove, Tonk Wall, and Cleveland rig lines as well. So they were um, attempting to, they called it plan at the time, pushing, pushing production, more production. And in 2013, um, I was part of the, let's call it the Western Andarco business unit. But I also played a little bit of role in the, the A and D and the BE teams there. And there was an NCAP back company called Four Year Energy Partners Three that was soliciting the market to invest themselves. And they had about a little under four hundred thousand leasehold acres um, that was, uh, for lack of a better term, a bolt a bolt on for Apache. And um, I think that I can't remember exactly what the production maybe is around twenty to twenty five thousand BO a day. And uh, given that a dovetail with Apache's existing position created some scale, that took, we ended up buying that position from Cordillera for a little over $3 billion, which gave Apache at time close to a million, uh, over a million grossly sold acres and close to 800,000 netly sold acres across the Interco Basin and Western Interco Basin. So after that acquisition, um, the Tulsa office for Apache ramped up in terms of hiring, in terms of staff. And we went from that nine rigs that I mentioned to 37 rigs, or at least over 35 rigs. I can't remember exactly. Wow. And testing all of those benches that, that I mentioned, primarily the Marmington D, the Cleveland, the Tonk Wall, the Cottage Grove, some Shawnee. Um, so there was some exploratory drilling going on and we had active leasing plays. And uh, so we, we managed over 30 rigs for a couple of years. And um, at, at the height, I had nine rig lines and um, they, they, I stayed with nine rig lines uh, for Apache and they wanted to, the scoop had already, had already been um, well known since about, I'd say about 2010, 2011. And Apache wanted to make a concerted effort to get into the scoop primarily in Grady County and Stevens County. So we had organic leasing play on the ground with about 70 uh, title land man and lease buyers um, to expand our position from 10,000 legacy acres to above 50,000 total acres. So once we were uh, stepping up towards closer to that 50,000 net acre position, we went ahead and threw two rigs into the scoop to test the Woodford primarily. So out of the nine rigs, I had seven in Western Oklahoma and I had two in the scoop. And um, Thanksgiving of 2014, uh, the market was a little bit oversupplied. We saw uh, a dip in oil prices. Um, Apache had transitioned to new, new leadership, new management in their corporate Houston office. Um, and that decision was made to um, start shutting down regional offices such as the Tulsa, uh, Tulsa office, which had been in Tulsa since the mid 50s, I believe. And so at that point, uh, a group of Apache, former Apache executives has started a private equity back company called Adelaide Resources um, here in Tulsa. So I jumped on uh, with them as a uh, land manager, I believe at the time was my role. And uh, they had already built a small position in Beckham County around Elk City to again, drill the granite wash. Um, but uh, much like Scoop, the staff was emerging for the Merrimack um, in Kingfisher County, moving into Blaine County. And we had an opportunity to lease about 5,000 acres from one mineral owner that was, I believe, about 10 sections. Um, so mostly operated 
and we went ahead and filed regulatory, uh, just spaced it and pulled it. Um, and some unsolicited offers came in to buy our position. So we ended up monetizing that position. Um, and, uh, that was, that was a very successful effort for Adelaide. Um, it was a, it was a nice multiple for them at the time. They maintained their, their Elk City operations, their, their, uh, their drilling operations. They're still testing multiple DSUs for the Marmonton. Um, but at that point, um, I left there to go to another private equity back company here in town called Panther Energy Company Three, and Panther Energy, um, the the management team at Panther Energy was uh, was Barry Mullinex and Roy Grossman. Those were the two that co-founded Panther and even multiple iterations before Panther. So I think that they were on their fifth iteration of a private equity back company by the time that I jumped on with Panther Energy Three, and um, they had just come off a successful exit out of the Delaware Basin to WPX. And so we were, it was, it was a really fun time because uh, Kane Anderson was the private equity backer of Panther Energy 3. And uh, again, this was 2017. So at this point in time, it was the large, largest capital commitment that Kane had given to the management team. So um, we just started looking at, at various plays. We looked at the Powder River Basin, we looked at the Eagleford, we went looked at Permian again, both on the Midland and Delaware side. We looked at Stack again, and we looked at the Bakken. And so we ended up landing on, based on, it was, it was somewhat opportunistic, of uh, uh, building a, a powder river basin position in Congress County, uh, just west, northwest of Douglas, the, the town of Douglas, organically. And so we started a, a, a pretty aggressive leasing effort. Uh, we made a, a, a few small uh, PDP plus acreage acquisitions in Congress County. So we built a position of almost 30,000 acres. We bought three wells and um, we ended up drilling two wells. And this was in 2019. And my role at Panther was VP of land and business development. Um, and so we were drilling two 10,000 foot laterals in the Niagara Shale and uh, in the powder. Uh, at the time, I believe it might still be, I'm not, I'm not sure I haven't done a look back, but it was the largest completion design that had been pumped on the, uh, on the Niagara Shell, which was over 600,000 barrels of water and over 30 million pounds of sand. So that came out to be about 60 barrels per foot, 3000 pounds per foot uh, on the crop load and fluid density side. Um, and luckily for us at Panther, the, the reservoir responded extremely well. We saw a ni nice uplift on, on rape, peak oil line and at EUR. Um, and so we had plans to continuously move forward with the Niagara development. We also had a couple other benches on the acreage, like the Mallory Shell and the Turner Frontier um, on our acreage that we were going to test as well. But uh, the OPEC Plus price floor started to take a little wind out of the, the sale of oil prices and then COVID hit. Um, I think we all kind of know what, what happened with oil prices after COVID. So um, uh, at that point, we had been given some guidance to find a buyer and we found a, we found a buyer out of Denver and we had a successful exit out of that play. And, uh, following that, um, I helped manage the asset for the buyer for, for uh, a period of time, given it Wyoming is, is a little unique in its regulatory system with the combination of, uh, with their pooling and spacing statutes along with state and federal minerals. I believe the state and federal minerals makes up about 60 to 70 percent of the mineral ownership in that state. Um, so I helped with that for a while. Then um, myself and a few other uh, Panther Energy executives uh, founded Heritage, and uh, now we have a, an operated, uh, a consolidated, continuous operated position in in the Bakken on the Montana side, and we're just moving forward with uh, development opportunities. Um, on our existing position. So that's that's kind of the timeline from 2007 to current of my role, my responsibilities, and what I've been. Man, so much going on. I know whenever you were talking about Apache, you talked about how things were a little fast-tracked, but I just want to say the whole thing is pretty fast-tracked in my opinion. I mean, it's incredible. I, you know, I was a college athlete as well, and you talked about working while you were playing football. I just can't imagine what that's like. But then again, you talked about running nine rigs and... Um, Rig lines and I, I yeah, so I, I understand that you have uh, a pretty high capacity 
Uh, and that's probably why Brandon wanted to have you on. So, uh, so much to work through, and we're going to talk about managing how to manage an operator here in a little bit. But before we do that, give us the differences and just what it was like to work, um, you know, from, you know, some of these smaller land companies all the way to, you know, some public companies and then getting into private equity. How does it differ working inside those, those different companies? Yeah. And, and so on the, on the more the land services side, uh, again, this is when I was in undergrad, but it's, it, you kind of operated with inside, you know, you, you give it a session township range, you go out and you go ahead and index everything, start pulling books, start chaining title, uh, look at the status of the section, whether HPP are open, leased, hundred percent leased, partially leased. And so, you know, those really, those to me, the way I look at them, those are your bookings. Like you're living with that section for 30 days. You're putting together your MOR, you're turning it in, you get the next one. And so going from that to Chesapeake, which at the time had, I want to say north of 12,000 employees, um, probably north of 2,000 landmen. Um, it, was, it, was, it was very exciting. It was a very exciting time to be at Chesapeake. Uh, not to say it's not now, but it, was, it, was, it felt um, very energetic. And given that Chesapeake was jumping in a lot of these unconventional shell gas plays. And with, with, a, with an effort, uh, you know, with a, with a goal or objective to go ahead and secure 500, 600, 700,000 um, large to basically control the play. And, um, and that was, that was fast paced. And what was interesting about the transition from Chesapeake to Apache is that Apache really didn't operate in terms of their land department, didn't operate with those aggressive leasing programs. They did a lot of farm outs. They did a lot of joint ventures. Um, they did a lot of partnerships with other companies to get wells drilled. So it was, I, I kept mentioning that rig one cause you, you're really abiding by that rig one on a section by section basis and determining your working interest in Iraq, okay, who your other partners are, who the well proposal is going to go out to, when the regulatory, regulatory needs to be filed, and then you start getting elections in from other partners, and that leads to a multitude of different things. Some non-ops want to do swaps, and so they want to swap out where you just proposed a well, and they want to swap into another section that say that, that, you, that you operate or control. And it's like, okay, well, then you, that leads to a whole new evaluation process. It's like, okay, well, I know that we want more working interest in this particular well, but I don't know if we want to go ahead and swap out on this other section because that might be the other section or other unit on the rig line. So there was a lot of that. There was a lot of trading, a lot of swaps. A, a, and Apache, you know, since they had been around Western Oklahoma for such a long time, there was a lot of older JOAs. And so it was... It was a lot of updating title, updating DTOs, taking a look at the JOA to see if everybody was subject to the JOA or they were subject to a legacy force pooling back in the eighties. And, um, so that was, that was, I would say that was a unique transition for me, given that the models at the time were very different from a land perspective. And then going from Apache to Adelia and then Panther and then heritage, the models kind of been the same where you're, you're building an asset. You're delineating, you're appraising the asset, adding value to it. Um, you're usually building it on the ground instead of making a large PDP acquisition that comes along, the acreage comes along with it. And so really since 2017 to now, I, from a land perspective, regulatory perspective, I've really done mostly the same, same thing in terms of building an asset, trying to add value to it through the drill bit. And then ultimately, you know, in the past that they have, they, they sold, we've divested them. So, um, I would, I think that probably answers your question, given the, the, the different lenses that you look through with, you know, from land service company to working for publics, then on private. Yeah. Stuff. You know, that, um, talking about Chesapeake is always interesting, you know, in those two thousands, they were doing it different than anybody and they had a completely different model. Um, and they were highly successful because of it. Aubrey was obviously a genius and uh, knew how to negotiate, knew how to make deals, knew how to make money. And I remember, and I, I keep forgetting the point that me and you were competitors in the Fayetteville Shell uh, and we never mm -hmm. met each other. Um, right. I was working for Southwestern Energy and he was working for Chesapeake and Southwestern was there probably four years prior to Chesapeake getting there. And then when Chesapeake came in, it changed the play, you know, just instantly day one. 
Um, they were aggressive. They didn't care what it took. They'd pay anything just to get a controlling interest in an area. Um, and the other companies had to keep up or ship out. And that was Aubrey's plan, right? So um, his his ideal was come into a play, pay more than anybody, be more aggressive, and um, take control. And they're mm-hmm. and companies are going to drop out because of that strategy. And and it and it worked a lot a lot of times so yeah. and then you're going to apache who's a little bit more conservative you know drawing that line um making deals with other companies aubrey didn't want to make a deal with anybody he wanted to run you know he wanted to run the play um mm-hmm. i think that's an interesting um contradiction there um and how successful chesapeake was at that point in time i mean it, yeah and, and that's a, that's a really good point because one thing uh, about Chesapeake jumping into these these gas plays, uh, these shale gas plays, like like Fayetteville, like you know, basically they, Chesapeake was a little late to the Barnett. Uh, I think XTO Mitchell, Devin bought Mitchell, and EOG. Those were the two leaders at the time, and um, it was still a, again a transitional time frame where a lot of companies didn't think that you could get hydrocarbons out of, out of shale. So and. Uh, so there was still some skepticism su- surrounding the Barnett and then ultimately it ended up being, you know, uh, the grandfather of all the shell plays. So it's just, they kind of had to, to, had to buy their way in, um, uh, through PDP and leasehold acquisitions and organic leasing too. So coming in any case, coming in a little late to the play, you're going to pay for it. Right. So, and so jumping into the Fayetteville where Chesapeake was, I would say one of the leaders um, getting into that point, obviously the discovery that Haynesville was huge for Chesapeake and then getting into Marcellus. But in, in every case, what was, what was great about Chesapeake, it was always technically based. So in terms of the geology and the petrophysics, um, the, the resource in place and turning that over to reservoir engineering to run single well economics when you didn't have a lot of data, you didn't have a lot of control, it, it justified being aggressive in these plays and building as large of a position as you could in that lasso around where, let's say, the Fayetteville's perspective or the Barnett's perspective. Um, and Brandon, to your point that we never ran into each other when you were working the Fayetteville and I was too, to be fair to probably both of us, it, it made up about six or seven counties. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, Van Buren and White really started it, but then it, it kind of ballooned into, you know, with, with additional wells being drilled, the plays getting delineated, it's being appraised in other, in other counties. But uh, I think I, I can, uh, I can see where we did bump into each other. It was, it's still to this day. It's a, it's a very large. Yeah, large it's point. still massive flywheels managing that now. And um, yeah, that was a, anyway, I thought that was interesting. Yeah, yeah definitely. Well, I, I want to continue, you know, going down here and thinking about, you know, your private equity experience, there's been a lot of changes there too. I want to talk about how, how to source capital and how it used to be and kind of how it is now. Um, can you give us any information on that? Any kind of, you know, take that you have? Sure. Um, and this is just my opinion on it because yeah. I've been pre COVID post COVID and that, that changed things to some degree. So traditionally, uh, you know, in the private equity space, is it, you want to build, uh, a contiguous acreage position and you want to drill five, 10, 15 wells to go ahead and de-risk all the acreage or as much acreage as you can that you secure and then uh, move to market for you to try to sell. Um, I think that throughout my roughly 18, 19 year career, I've seen oil prices hit a hundred, three times, four times, maybe three, four times. So um, it's, it's it's interesting looking at you know pre-COVID when oil hit 100 and the rig count across the lower 48 versus the way it is now. When we're it looks like we're approaching 100, we may not get there, but we're above 90 today. So today we're sitting at you know between 670 and 680 rig counts in the lower 48. We've seen times in the past where oil is approaching 100. There's 2,000 onshore breaks. So. For a period of time that, that um, a lot of management teams had access to capital to go ahead and, and um, build out that model that I described that was more pre-COVID where 
uh, you're building organically and you're, and you're drilling wells and there's capital to drill wells and to take a little bit more risk with stepping out in a certain area within a play and, and de-risking your acreage. And so it was, it was very much growth through the drill bit, um, with a three to five or seven year plan to monetize, um, post COVID the, you know, to source capital, it's become a little bit more difficult just because we had experiences where we've drilled ourselves into, um, the industry has drilled itself into uh, a little bit of a, of a dilemma where the wells or the program is not successful. The resource isn't there. And I think capital has noticed that. So now what, what I'm seeing is that capital is still somewhat available, um, to the, to the oil and gas space, but most of the wells that are being drilled as part of that 670, 680 onshore rigs, it looks like to me, it's mostly, uh, infill drilling. And when I say infill drilling, it's, uh, where you've got a, a drilling space unit, I call it a DSU that has a parent well, whether it's drilled 2013 or 2020, and it's a good well that you're going back into that unit and you're, you're filling in those sticks and you're drilling additional wells within a unit that there is very little subsurface risk and or very little commercial risk. So uh, I don't see a lot of, you know, I would say pure exploration dollars um, in any play right now. So it's very concentrated, very disciplined drilling or companies are being very disciplined with their capital. And that's on the private side and the public side. And what's interesting on the public side and this has gone for the last couple of years is really where they're, they're drilling their best wells first. And if, if a well doesn't meet a certain internal rate of return, let's call it 25 or even 50%, then that well's not being drilled. The excess cash flow, um, that's the, the program where the company is making, it's going back to shareholders in the form of dividends and or stock repurchases. Um, so more money is being given back to, to investors and to shareholders. And so that, that's kind of the, that's kind of the lens that we're looking through today is it's, it's more disciplined. It's very much more focused within specific areas or specific units versus more of the broad brush. Here's the outline of the play and we can drill across any, any DSU in section within the outline of the play. And that's just, that's not the case. Now. Yeah. Is that same lens something that you kind of foresee staying for a while, or do you think that what, like, what is the next iteration? Maybe if you had to guess, right? If you're just kind of forecasting and seeing trends and how it might turn out. I, I think companies are going to continue, whether they're private or public, I think they're going to continue to try to finance their own drilling operations through cash flow. And I, I think that that is, um, that's, that's the motivation. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we, you know, we're in a boom and bust industry. So we've seen a lot of price spikes and a lot of dips during COVID we saw for a day, negative 34, $37 a barrel. And I, I think that uh, capital sources have taken notice of that. But we, I mean, we, there's some there's some external factors that are driving the price of oil too that people are looking at and, and waiting on, like the um, the lollipop production cuts out of El Pet. And I know Saudi is their their production has dropped pretty substantially. Iran's production has actually increased, and so we're seeing that in combination. I mean, it's to me, it's not. We're in a nine dollar oil environment, not so much from the demand side, but from the supply side. Um, so we're still very much undersupplied for the most part. Uh, with you know, there's just no new, there's no new plays being discovered. There's not a lot of additional production being brought online, even though we're still, I believe, we're still producing about twelve million barrels a day, uh, which is a global leader. Uh, the U.S. is, but um, that's in. To the, to, to the demand side that we're seeing demand numbers out of China, they're not as strong as what we anticipated. Mm -hmm. And even post COVID now, I think we're still seeing the effects of a lot of people working from home and not working from home five days a week, but you know, maybe one or two or three days a week, they're working from home and they go into the office two or three days a week. So their normal route that they're using drive, that's being, you know, that's being taken out. That's, that's, that's out of the equation. So, um, so, I, just to touch on there's, there's, I think people are watching this, that type of data, global data come out to see where prices are going to go. Um, yeah. So yeah, yeah, it's, 
it's a it's a very interesting time in both the public and, and the private equity space. Yeah, we've got ninety dollar oil, but it feels more like sixty, doesn't it? <laughs> you know, it's, it's and it's felt like that for yeah, a couple of years, to be yeah, honest. It has, and um, also just to one of your other points, and Harold Ham talks about this in his book a little bit too. You know, the day of the wildcatter is. I mean, there are no wildcatters really anymore. You have mm-hmm. you have some small produ- producers, some small companies drilling shallow wells, and but even they know what they're going to get. You know, going into a new area where like the shell plays. Yeah, they thought they had it figured out. They didn't know until they drilled a few wells and, and refined, you know, it didn't take one or two wells. It took several wells and to refine that process and they're still doing it today. But the day of the wildcatters gone, um, it'd be nice to see that come back at some point. And I know there's a lot of guys right. like Harold Ham that would love to do that. But as you said, right, it takes capital. And, and that's, I think that's one of the reasons why Mr. Ham, I'm going to call him, um, why he went uh, private with his company. And he wants to do, mm-hmm. he wants to do more uh, out of the box things at this point. Right. Yes. That he also had the benefit of owning over 70% of well, the outstanding shares well, too. Yeah, yeah. So that, that helps. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think that, you know, it's, you know, this, this industry is so unique. And uh, there's so little content out there on it. I think there needs to be a lot more. But, you know, we talked about the Barnett, Fayetteville, Paintsville, the Marcellus. And we really didn't find an oil, let's call it an unconventional oil play or a shell oil play until the Bakken. And the Bakken really opened things up, coupled with the Eagleford. Um, but, you know, that to me, that was that was the game changer. It's once we can start extracting oil from, from tight shell formations, um, it really it's one of the reasons why why heritage uh, is in the market, just because there is a lot of resource in place that has not been that has not been drilled yet, but for the most part. So there's still areas, I, I believe, in the lower 48. Uh, I, I know that there's areas in the Bakken. and there's certainly uh, probably some areas in Eagleford and the Scoop and the Stack. Even though the Scoop is probably a little bit more of a of a NGL. Uh, high volume gas play with associated oil, um, but there's still areas that are very respected, even at seventy dollar oil. So, you know, you have to sit back and ask yourself, well, like, why are why aren't these townships, why aren't these sections, why aren't these units being developed right now? Um, and that's to me, that's mainly because companies are are being much more disciplined with their capital um, than they than they were pre COVID or let's say 2013, 14, or 2017, 18. So, um, yeah, it's, it's definitely an interesting time. Yeah. Well, we've talked about it like several different factors, but one that we really haven't touched on is kind of the shifts in regulation. And a lot of that is influenced by elections. Um, and we've got one coming up, you know, talk about some of the re- regulatory shifts that you've seen and, you know, what you see maybe happening in the next one and a half years as we approach the election. Sure. I think I think the, the biggest shift that I've seen is the um, I guess the difficulty to for an operator to secure a, a permit from the BL drill well and or um, to get a unleased field of track nominated uh, in order to go to a public auction to secure the lease. So um, you know we we talked a little bit about the Powder River Basin where I mentioned that state fed probably make up about seventy percent of the mineral ownership within the state. And I think that uh, amongst all the plays, all the active plays that are have rigs running right now, I think that powder is probably the most effective. By that. Just because there's there's very little, most of the formations being the the Nyberg Shell, the Tartar Frontier, and the Mallory, uh, those are the three benches that are primarily being developed in the Powder River Basin. There's very few uh, units. Let's call it 1,280 acre units that do not have BLM minerals, whether they're leased or unleased. So if they are leased, then you need to secure a BLM, we call it an APD, so a permit. And I, last time I heard the time frame in order to secure a permit, if you can secure one, is between you know six or nine months, sometimes up to 12 months. So from a capital planning standpoint, that really throws a monkey wrench into what you're trying to do. Um, so, to, to me, it, that's the biggest change I've seen on the BLM front with not opening up additional BLM minerals to be leased, 
and um, making the process a little bit more seamless for an operator um, to secure a permit. And in, in, again, in very prospective areas, where, where the BLM will most certainly benefit from royalty revenue. So the BLM and yeah. the U.S. citizen, obviously. Um, mm -hmm. I was talking to somebody, and you can confirm this for me. I don't know how true it is. And um, there were some BLM lands up for sale. I think there were like 60 tracks. By the time it got to sell, there was one available. What mm -hmm. what causes that? It, what what causes the BLM to pull those tracks down from the cell? Is it a NEPA thing or? It, it could, yeah, it could be a NEPA thing. It could be an environmental impact study. It could be a forest service uh, issue. It could be a wetlands issue, um, uh, an archeological issue, a biological issue. So the, a, a lot of these things uh, are studies that the BLM does when a track is nominated. And I think the level of frustration comes in is that they've got a lot of discretion with pulling those tracks off the auction list. Uh, and so if you're an operator and you nominate a track and it looks, and it's in Wyoming and it looks fairly perspective, fairly calm, um, but you don't see it on sale for two years, you know, an operator's going, can you advise me why that is? And sometimes you get an answer and sometimes you doubt. Uh, so. That, in my experience, those are, you know, the four or five reasons that I see tracks being pulled off the yeah, options. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's, that causes a whole nother concern, right? Because there's some money invested in even nominating those tracks. And, um, yeah. yeah. And so, it, you know, that gets more into a, like a public policy yeah. Um, yeah. discussion where, uh, you know, oil is at $9 a barrel for the industry. That's obviously a strong oil price for... Uh, everyday citizens that, you know, go into the pump that, uh, that's not so great. Uh, we have the ability to push prices down in plays like out of river basin and others that have heavy federal, uh, unleased minerals or, uh, in order to get a permit. So, you know, the powder, I think out of all the plays that are active and that includes the, mainly the oil plays I and mean, the Permian, I mean, oil, of the 670 rig, I think half of them are in the Permian right now. So uh, they don't have that issue, but the thing about Permian, the Powder, the Bakken, the Eagleford um, stack, I think, you know, amongst those plays, um, there's still a lot of resource, recoverable resources in place that can facilitate and putting down the pressure on oil prices. But because of some of the public policy hurdles, that's, that's just not conceivable. Right. Yeah. Speaking of public policy, how do you feel like the election, you know, how is that going to impact the next one and a half years and beyond? Yeah, I think, I think that there's going to be a lot of companies that are, I mean, right now they're probably putting their 2024 budgets together. I suspect that uh, much of that budget is going to be spent in the first quarter uh, of next year. And, and they're going to sit back and maybe wait to see how the election results go. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, there's, there's just been such a, I mean, for lack of a better phrase, a very anti oil and gas sentiment the last couple of years. Yeah. And, uh, it has, it has affected many things. I mean, including capital, uh, about not getting into the space. So I, I think that, I think what's going to, companies are just going to observe how the election results go. I don't see a change in their plan and how they put capital on the locations that they pick. I don't, I don't see any uh, substantial or significant need to increase rig count. I don't see, I don't see public companies doing that. Um, but the good news with public companies in terms of the S and P is that they really outperform every different space or set, um, including tech. So I, I think that capital will slowly move its way back into the, the oil and gas space. Um, how the election results go. I, I don't know. And I don't know what the pivot point is for a lot of companies, PE or private or public, but, um, that's just my take on, they're just going to probably spend a great deal of their 2024 budget in Q1 mm -hmm. and then see how the election results. Yeah, turn out. That's, that's pretty much what we see every four years. I mean, it's we'll yeah. slow down, wait and see. And then depending on how it works out, they get going again one way or another. Right. And, and you know, depending on how that works out amongst other things, 
um, when the OPEC production cuts roll off. And at some point, I believe that um, public oil and gas companies are going to have to show investors a mechanism for growth. Mm-hmm. And, um, and that usually comes in the form of either making a large acquisition into a new play or bolting onto an existing play um, or uh, commencing a couple of leasing campaigns and, and drilling new wells in new areas. So um, no, that's like we talked about last couple of years, it's, it's been very disciplined. It's been returning capital to investors through dividends and stock repurchases, which um, I, I think that space is extremely happy about that. But it, at some point, I, I think that companies are going to have to show a mechanism for growth. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. We know that, I mean, there's a couple of things we know. We know that undrilled inventory is getting low, for sure. Uh, based on that internal rate of return cutoff that we talked about, whether it's 25% or 50% rate of return, we know inventories are getting low. And the, the plays that have the largest undrilled inventory, and from what I've seen, is the bucket, the powder, and there's some areas, extensional or ex- expansive areas in the permian as well. Um, so, you know, that's, that's, uh, to point to the mechanism for growth, that's, that's kind of how, you know, I see, you know, the space at large is that, um, there's, there's always reports every week that come out about remaining, you know, remaining inventory for these companies. Right. And l- largely that's done by external sources that just look at a map and they see how many, how many sticks are in a DSU across a large play and say, okay, well, you only have like, this many locations left. And, um, and that's where we get back to the infill drilling that most of the locations are being taken off the board within those DSUs. And there's not a lot of opportunity outside of those units for these companies that they want to pursue at the moment. They just want to drill their, their best wells right now, which, which they most certainly should. But, um, and living within cash flow and, and finding to your joint operations, I mean, that is obviously absolutely fantastic. But I just think at some point there's going to have to be um, a, a switch on, on the growth side that they're going to have to go ahead and get. Man, well, this has been fantastic. You're a wealth of knowledge, Josh. Uh, I want to move into kind of the next part of our conversation, which is really just how a, a service company can manage an operator. Um, and so I want to get from your perspective, what do you look for in a service company? You know, Brandon, I'm excited to hear your perspective on this too. But Josh, what do you have whenever you're you know, looking to a service company to help you out? What are some of the things that you're you know, focusing in on? I Honestly, it's it's probably any cost cutting measure on the on the title side, um, and you know when I, when I got into the the oil and gas industry, I was told by you know people much older than me, you absolutely have to understand title in order to be a landman, and regardless of what your role is within a land service company, public or private, you have to understand title. You have to understand how to, how to meet landowners face to face, negotiate oil and gas leases. Um, and then that gets more into the, you know, you need to understand HPP title, due diligence, and basically how, how do you add value on the, on the land service side? I think that, you know, as an example, um, if Heritage were to reach out to, uh, you know, a land service company and say, Hey, we've got this section, uh, it looks perspective to us for whatever XYZ formation. Um, can you, can you go ahead and give us kind of an audit of that section, uh, of how you approach it? So let's just say hypothetically, uh, if half that section is leased, well, there's no reason to run title on that half section. If somebody's taking three or five year leases on, on the east half, it's like, okay, well, let's cut out the east half. Let's only focus on the west half. Okay, so let's talk about the west half. When's the last base leases that were taken in the west half? Let's say it's 2017. So, okay, well, looks like the majority of the west half um, has a nice set of base leases that have expired. So we've got relatively good names and addresses from the mineral ownership on the West half. We can do a, you know, a quick cursory check to see if they divested themselves of their minerals between 2017 and now, and then start making those contacts. So making those contacts, I think is critical and getting those verbal commitments and then maybe running reverse title on the backside from, you know, 2023 back to at least 2017, if not all the way back to patent just confirm that they own what they think that they own. 
I think those are the little intricacies that, that are cost, cost cutting, cost saving for operators instead of saying, here's a section of land and a land service company goes, okay, well, then we're just going to run the whole thing from patent and um, we'll probably deliver it to you within 30 to 60 days. And in 30 or 60 days, let's say somebody else has approached it with a different strategy and the West Path is now 100% leased. So essentially you've got a mineral ownership report that you can do nothing with um, because the whole section is leased. So I think those, those type of things of, of coming up with unique ways, and a lot of it comes from industry experience, right? Being, being on that side for a long period of time, um, how you can help operators other, you know, public, private oil and gas companies say that. Absolutely. And you have a, you have a great perspective on our industry because you were in it. Right. And I think mm -hmm. it takes exactly what you were saying. We do do that for some clients. Uh, we do it more on the due diligence side, obviously, but um, it really takes a in-house land man to know what they're doing with that particular unit. And, how quickly we need to get in there, or how competitive it is and what you really want out of it. I think most companies usually are going into it going, we're going to get a title opinion. Um, for a title opinion, you're going to have to take a patent to present. You're going to have to build a run sheet and try to make what we do is we try to make it easy for the attorney because usually they're, while we're $550 a day, they're $450 an hour, you know? So right. the better product that we can hand to that particular attorney so he can, or he or she can get through it quicker, ultimately in the end saves money. So I think what Josh is getting to point, there's a lot of ways to do this job. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to do it. And depending on what our clients needs are, uh, you approach it differently. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I've worked with yeah. Josh for a long time. He's always coming up with great ideas on, on how to do something. And, and it does. I mean, it, I don't know how much actually on the back end falls on you, Josh, but I mean, we get through your stuff pretty quickly because you know what you because you yeah. know what you want, you know, and that's, that's right. a big part of that. Yeah, I, you know, I think you know, another, you know, Brandon, you talked about that. I was thinking about other examples um, as well. If, if it's a if it's a PDP acquisition due diligence problem, and you're buying ten wells, and let's say the majority of the purchase price is concentrated in three of those ten wells, it's like, well, let's let's start there. And if it's on a low board basis and you're just buying the PDP, then essentially you just need to confirm and verify working interest title inside well, within that particular role, right? Don't need to worry about leasehold. Don't need to worry about um, conveyances that are outside the board. So I, I think, you know, in terms of building that run sheet that you mentioned, like you, you can, you can, you know, efficiently take a lot off the board on that run sheet on a section by section basis by kind of, and sometimes it's on the operator too, of, of properly communicating and conveying what, what the needs are. But you can take a lot of those instruments off the table and not have to look at them. Go back and look at them after the fact, obviously, but in terms of getting, moving towards closing, that's really what you need. So you got, you're buying 10 wells for $10 million and $8 million is made up of three to 10 wells. So, okay, well, th those are the three we need to hydrate, we need to focus on. That's a very small example because I'm assuming that the due diligence projects you guys are being now are very large and they make up multiple counties that have hundreds of wells in them. Yeah. But we have, uh, I think part of, part of the relationship between operator and land service company is, especially on a due diligence project, is understanding how the value is allocated and broken down as part of that acquisition. Yeah, we, we do a lot of due diligence. It really takes you guys that you guys can get a, a, a clear line of sight on what your objectives and focus will be like, here's my tier one objective. Here's my tier two objective versus, you know, let's broad brush. This is what we're buying. And we need to know what we're going to own in every single lease, what we're lease, unit lease, sold lease, um, you know, those type of things. I, I think that, <laughs> um, that really muddies the water up a lot on your side. I would oh, say. it does. And we have to get real creative. You know, we do them all different, really. Um, but because you're right, most clients come to us, go, give us the total package. It's like, I've got 30 days, <laughs> you know, and, yeah. and really that right. narrows down to 20 days, which really narrows down to about 18 because I need to get you the defect report. Right. You've got, right. we've got tw at the most 21 working days 
to get this done. And we've got to get creative. Um, I haven't seen a due diligence over 30 days and I can't tell you how long um, when actually you probably need it. But, you know, to your point, you know, another way to do that is if you've got production and you know it's holding that unit, I mean, and you're wanting to get through a lot, you start looking at revenue and jib statements and um, buying production. Right. It's producing, it's held. I mean, how much risk is there that something's wrong and are you willing to take that risk, you know, and assume it? Right. Um, so, yes, we get extremely creative on the due diligence side and it takes several conversations usually. Yeah. And I, you know, I see and this is where uh, open line of, commu of communication and clarity on, on the relationship between a land service company operator comes in. You know, most of these companies, when they're making, especially a PDP acquisition, where they're buying a set of wells and they're, they're buying it at what the seller is saying that the NRI is. It's like, okay, well, in these 10 wells, the NRI is this, 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 and this. So not only do you have to confirm the well or working interest within those 10 wells, but you have to confirm that they own what they claim that they own in terms of the NRI, which is really a much bigger issue, in my opinion, than the working interest, because that's how you make your money. So, uh, and, you know, if, if you've got a base lease that's an eight, because most of the properties on these new buildings are that they're legacy properties that are producing for 20 or 30 years, right? So if you got a base lease 30 years ago, that's at an eight, and you've got 50 override conveyances that are tied to that well. That's going to, on just one of, let's say, again, a hypothetical 10 wells, one of those 10 wells, that's going to probably take longer than 30 days. And if they're claiming 80s, and, you know, I've seen cases where, you know, the, the land service comes back, like, look, they don't own 80s, they own 71s. Yeah. So if they've got that many overrides, there is no way they're 80. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah, days, but yeah, you're right. It's, um, yeah, everything, all the due diligence projects that we work are, are completely different every time. And, and it's yeah. actually, and you're making a point how it's allocated. Right. You know, how are you allocating that value? Yeah. What are you actually buying? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's, you know, and that's looking at through the title names, right. On the, Confirming mineral ownership, working ownership, and NRI. And then you've got another layer on top of that in terms of maybe a legacy PEP acquisition due diligence projects of pref rights, AMIs, um, could be some squirrely JOAs and have some interesting language that um, can lead to defects as well. So, uh, you know, have, and I think a lot of this is uh, like, let's say on your side, is that having experience actually going through these, these processes over and over and over again, because, uh, you know, every, every section is different. Every well is different. Every lease is different. So you very rarely see the same scenario over and over and over and over again. Um, so especially dealing with legacy properties, new properties that were drilled 2017, 18. Okay. Base leases in 2014. Okay. Uh, you're confirming mineral ownership in a section that's got four mineral owners. Perfect. Okay. That's okay. That's, that's like a dream, right? Oh, no. But it, hardly it works out. Yeah. And, and you make a great point to newer production than older, older production was a lot of times drilled off a land man mineral ownership report. And right. uh, nowadays, if you've got new production, you've probably got a title opinion in the last 20 years, which, yeah. which you can base all your title off of and makes it a little bit quicker. But then again, if it's also 20 years old, in the stack or the scoop, a lot's happened in 20 years and, um, yeah. it can still take some time digging into that. So, yeah. And that's, and that's another thing that is, is a complexity and a challenge for the, for the broker is that, uh, you know, I was taught that if your file room burns up, you can always go to the courthouse and recreate. Right. So. Uh, in a lot of cases, I would say that some private agreement uh, that was consummated by buyer and seller back in the 80s and 90s, there's no memo or affidavit file of record to memorialize that. Yeah. So you, you kind of go, okay, um, you might get a little reference into it on a working interest conveyance. It's like, okay, subject to letter agreement dated January 1, 1983. It's like, okay, don't know what that is. Um, well, we're going to defect it anyway. 
Yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> you don't know what it is. Yeah, but you, don't, you don't know. It could have a rofer, it could have a prefer. Um, so um, we could talk. We could talk I mean, due diligence for about three days straight. I think. I know. <laughs> yeah. Due diligence is tough. Yeah, it is. Man, you you're given so many great examples here of you know what is so valuable about an experienced service company that you really align with. You've been working with DLC on some projects. What can you tell us a story or maybe a product that was given to you by DLC that exceeded your expectations that you were just over the moon about uh, that you can we can share with our listeners? Um, I think that um, I think one was it was actually a due diligence project on a potential acquisition that was that, that never transacted, unfortunately, because the the spread between. Um, Purchase price and um, was too far apart time, but it was it was more of a hey, uh, can you guys take a cursory look at this working interest in these wells across these sections, and and can you somehow look into a way to expedite um, the turnaround time? And it was done extremely efficiently and quick. And in fact, um, what the potential seller that never ended up selling. What they claimed that their NRI was, um, it ended up being much higher, actually, uh, based on based on Dudley's uh, title research. So, uh, and that's that's actually why, because I was thinking about that example, and that's why I gave the NRI example um, uh, in terms of burdens at the Hades and seventy ones. But that's not what happened with with the potential transaction we were working at the time. But that's but it was I think it was around two weeks, just real quick. And it wasn't a lot of wells. I think it was like five wells, five units. At the time, we wanted the well we're working at just one, the PDP, and we wanted to lease hold for upside future development. And so, um, and it was, it was severed. So there was a disparity between working interest in the leasehold versus the well board. And then there was a disparity in NRI in the well board versus the leasehold. So it was just two weeks, real quick, got back to us. And, and, and that, to me, that's, that was what was huge is that. Unless you've got title experience of looking at well bore instruments versus leasehold instruments and breaking that down into two separate unit summaries on a unit by unit basis or section by section basis, then having that experience is really invaluable to a uh, you know, potential purchaser of oil and gas properties. Well, Josh, this has been a fantastic interview. I think we've kept you longer than uh, we've asked. So uh, we appreciate your time. Um, so many great takeaways for our listeners. But how can anybody get in touch with you if they'd like to? Uh, my email is uh, Josh C J O S H C at Heritage Energy LLC dot com, and that's probably the best way to get all of me. Okay, sounds good. Well, we'll we'll have that for our listeners, and yeah, appreciate you having uh, being on with us. And Brandon, thanks for inviting Josh. Yeah, thanks, Josh. I really appreciate it. Thanks, guys, for the time. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Land Department. Check out our website in the show notes or visit dudley-land.com to learn more about us.